In Matthew 4, 1 through 2, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. How many of you knows how many days he's in there? 40. 40. Okay? If I was going to be tempted to turn stones into bread, that temptation could have started on day two. All right? All I got to do is fast one day and, I, and, I, and I'm hungry. Can I get a witness? Right? 40 days. 40 days. I mean, one day of fasting, getting hungry. The next day, you know, the enemy starts with the temptations. Give it three days, four days. We're out of the wilderness. We're, we're ministering. We're touching the sick. We're, we're preaching truth. See? That's my good American mind. I don't know if you realize that shortly after he comes out of the wilderness, he spends a little time teaching. He calls four fishermen to uh, be his disciples. But the next big event is he goes to a wedding where he turns water into wine. Okay, how many of you have a daughter that you're going to have to give in marriage someday? Anybody got one of those left? Yeah. Hey, can I tell you something? Just be glad you didn't live back then. Because a wedding took Seven days, five, if, if it's a short wedding. Oh, it's a short wedding. It's only five days. No, seven days, seven days, dad, you are feeding them and taking care of them and entertaining them. It had the cost of a fortune. Jesus goes to a wedding, seven more days. We got 40 days. We got maybe a couple of weeks in between. We got, the, we got the seven day wedding. I mean, come on, Lord. You've only got three and a half years. You're the answer to all the questions. You're the one that can fix everything that is messed up and you are lollygagging. You are spending all this time. And that's my good American mind. See, the, the thing is, is, is when we start to look at Christ, if we really begin to look at him, it, it, it has the ability to help us in our spirit perspective because we are so time driven time controlled and um, we don't really grasp that when you only have a little over three years that you don't really have time to be doing 40 days out in the wilderness I mean come on the world needs you the devil's already damned why you gotta spend 40 days out there fighting with him We'll talk about that next week. But that whole mentality of how he is, as I would call it, easing into ministry in contrast to what we'll see with Paul. But 40 days a week, none of these things really matter because he is God over time. He has inserted himself into time, but still he's God over time in absolute control of everything. And uh, that's, that's not changed. And yet we have a hard time seeing that. Um, and I think we always will until we understand what it means to abide in him. And that was the big point for last week about abiding. And, and there it is again about abiding. Yeah. When we're abiding in Jesus, we're always where we're supposed to be. And I need you to, to try to remember that. That's important. Because there are so many times the enemy is going to come at you and your timetable. He's going to come at you about, about things and you're already in such pressure and in such high speed and whatever. And you just need to remember this. Everybody, you need to remember this, that when you are abiding in Jesus, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. There's not another place you need to be. I can't tell how many times I have come right here in this, in, in this sanctuary because I love to pray in here. And I have come in here and I am praying. And before you know it, there's this thought in the back of my head, you need to go call somebody. You, you need to go, you need to get in there and finish your sermon. You need. No, there's no place you need to be more than abiding with Jesus Christ. And yet that is not what I see about the American church. So, uh, I believe there's a huge contrast between Jesus and Paul, and I believe that the life of the church has actually 
been shaped more by the life of Paul than it has been by the life of Christ. And that's what we're talking about. And um, uh, if you don't think that is so, then I would encourage you to just do something real simple. You can do it tomorrow. Don't do it right this moment, but you can do it tomorrow. Do it this afternoon. And that is this. Go read any letter that Paul wrote and give it contrast to 1 John. And see the difference between the mentality of Jesus' disciple and possibly one of Jesus' greatest converts. Okay? Um, anyway, Paul's writings, I think, set up the skeleton of the church. And I think it's on the basis of that. Now, I think in America, we've gone overboard because that's what we do in America. We just take anything and just go crazy with it. And I think we've done that in the American church. Um, and I think because of that, what we see is that the church is so much compelled by its agendas, by its schedules, uh, you know, bottom lines, organization, ministries, got to have ministries, lots of ministries, ministries to everybody, missionaries. And none of those things are wrong. Teaching, oh, we got to have lots of teaching. Got to have Sunday school for this age bracket, that age, every age bracket. With, and none of it's wrong necessarily, but I, I, I see that we have become so, the machinery that we have created to do the work of the Lord now maybe is controlling the work of the Lord more than the Lord is controlling his work. And I'll explain that more as we go through this, but I'm, I'm not saying systems are wrong, but where were those systems during Jesus's time? Where was that urgency that we have basically built the whole church around, that urgency of reaching the lost? Where was all of that? And you may say, well, yeah, but Jesus was Jesus. He's not like us. He's Jesus. Okay. But what you have been called to is not the church, but to Jesus. Well, once when Jesus left... And the church began and got started, it had to get organized so that it could fulfill the Great Commission. Well, I'm going to say yes and no to that answer or that response. The first church actually continued with the very model of Jesus. The first church did not look anything like this. They got together. And, and there was an intimacy. And you know what they did in there? They said, now, this is who Jesus was. This is what he taught us. These are the things that he said we needed to pass down to you. And I believe that when you know this, you'll know him. Because the whole goal was to help Everybody know Jesus. <clears throat> it was basically Disciple 101. And it was great. And the church was what? Growing so fast they couldn't even keep up with it. And yet they didn't change the model. They just continued to just grow with it. Now, <clears throat> they did fail at getting the gospel to the nations until persecution they didn't quite, you know, they sort of stayed in Jerusalem, Mary, and like, whoo, this is really good, what God's doing here. Didn't move. Um, but even then, when you see that they are scattering and going to all these different areas, you see the very same model take place, and that is connecting people in an intimate way to Jesus Christ. The number one goal that they had was not that, okay, now you got to, you, you, you got to go tell your neighbor right this moment about Jesus Christ because that's the way it works. No, it was, you need to know who Jesus is. And when you have that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, then what will come out of that will be organic. It will happen naturally. <clears throat> now, I'm not against organization, but I'm just wanting you to consider that I think the church has taken up more along the lines of the model of Paul than it has the ministry 
of Jesus. Uh, Jesus eased in. I opened with, we are like two months into his ministry and to a large degree, my American mind would say, uh, he's just not getting much done. He's just not, he's just not getting going here very good. And yet he was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. Now, Paul was right the opposite. Paul explodes. Acts 9.20 says, and immediately he, who's that he? That's Paul. And immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he's the son of God. Three verses later, it says, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Now think about it for just a moment. Paul has done in three days what Jesus took three years to do. Get everybody so riled they want to kill him. <clears throat> and basically everything, Paul is fast-tracking. He's moving things along quickly. He bypassed, you might say in many ways, the disciples in, in a short period of time. He goes on to write more letters than anybody he spreads the redeeming work of Jesus further than anybody. But why? Is it because he was so well trained? He sat under the feet of Gamaliel. One of the greatest rabbis of the time was Gamaliel. He sat under that. He was trained. He had an edge. Is that what it was? Or maybe it was the fact that he was an apostle to the Gentiles instead of the Jews, and there was just a whole lot more of them than there was Jews. So therefore, he just had, you know, he had 10 to 1 opportunities. Or maybe it's because he's trying to make up for lost time. Undo what he did. <clears throat> Jesus invested three years in building his disciples, pouring into them, training them three years. At that same, or right after that same time, Paul shows up and he spends five years trying to kill every one of those disciples that Jesus had made. Now, I don't know about you, I'd carry some serious guilt I mean, I might be able to say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me and saving me, but God, how can I ever undo what I have done? I have blood on my hands. I have people right this moment that's in prison. I can't even get them back out because of what I've done. Paul was a zealot. Please hear me, a zealot. That's the way he was trained. That's the way he was brought into his whole mentality of thinking. He says he's a zealot, even in Galatians 1, 14. It's why he would describe himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. So you take your Pharisees and how much they were pushy about everything, and he's pushier than the pushy. That's probably bad English in some way, but anyway. Now, I'm sharing all this with you to get you to think. I want you to think. I need you to think. My goal is to inform you of what I'm seeing in the scriptures, challenging you to look at them with me, but for what purpose? Because when we get done, or somewhere in the middle of this maybe, my whole challenge and hope is that you would Understand what following Jesus should look like as opposed to maybe what it has become. Because isn't that really what we want? As a Christian, I want to follow Jesus. But as I told you two weeks ago, I think I've done a better job of following Paul than I have him, which is not bad. It's just not as good. When we look at Paul, you see a lot of things. His conversion, it was miraculous, amazing, 
amazing. His ability to change or, or to reach the nations, he was God ordained for what he was called to do. He was a new creation. Largest paper I wrote when I was in college was on the life of Paul. I've always been fascinated by him. He's always been one of my heroes. <clears throat> but Paul wasn't Jesus. He was not Jesus. And why do we have to necessarily shape everything sort of the, through the eyes of Paul when we can also, when we can better shape it through the eyes of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Paul was called what he was equipped to do. He, God called him. He was, there was nobody better that could do what Paul had to do, the ministry that he had. But you and I were not called necessarily to say, you know, Paul's the example, Paul's the example. We were called that Christ Jesus is the example for us. And our call to follow Jesus gives me the ability to say to every one of you what I'm saying to myself, and that is, is maybe I have focused too much attention on, on, on sort of seeing Jesus through Paul's eyes when I have the ability to see Jesus through the eyes of Peter and John and Andrew and those who were up close and personal and intimate and day by day by day. We're going to talk about what discipleship gave them the opportunity to do. I want that. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Paul and Jesus were basically contemporaries. Paul was just a little younger than Jesus. And here's the thing that's crazy. Paul studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was basically a great rabbi in Jerusalem. Paul studied under Gamaliel, probably was just a few years after Jesus at the age of 12 in Jerusalem is expounding on knowledge that he has about God to the point that the rabbis are astonished. You know who could very well have been one of the rabbis in that room that day that was listening to him expound? Gamaliel. This was his territory. Think about it for just a moment. And then think about this. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if Jesus had looked over at his disciples and he said, hey, I got one more disciple that I need to get. Let's go down to Jerusalem because I need to pick up this guy named Saul. Talking about a great asset. He's going to be a great asset. We need to get him in here, let him spend this last couple of years or two and a half years getting molded after me. Wouldn't the church have benefited from that? Think of all the people he killed and put in prison. That wouldn't have never happened. And it wasn't God's will, which is amazing because God in his unmatched wisdom knows what he's doing. But Paul was over here getting a completely different kind of training than the disciples were over here. And yet their trajectory was going was to collide on the way to Damascus right after he sees to it that a man of God is killed by stones for preaching truth that he did not agree with. So here's my point. Paul never had the privilege Please, just, just open your mind the best you can. Paul never had the privilege to sit under the feet of Jesus. Did he meet Jesus? He did. It was a glorious, <laughs> it was a glorious meeting that began with basically, why are you fighting me so much? He did not get to sit under the feet of Jesus like the disciples did. So here's my point. Paul was saved by Jesus, but programmed by Gamaliel. Paul was saved by Jesus, but programmed by Gamaliel. There's not one person in this room that everything you hear come out of my mouth, you have to process by what you think before you came in here. 
You, everything that you hear coming from me, it, it has to bounce off of your indoctrination of what you were taught. It has to process through the culture and the ideology and the preconceived ideas that you have to get to you before you can have a, this moment where you say, uh-huh. As natural as breathing, we are already preconditioned. The reason why this is a huge challenge for me is because I am battling all of my 40-something years of preconditioning. My 40-something years of how ministry works, how the church functions, and, and, and my love of the Apostle Paul and his phenomenal work to reach the lost. <clears throat> We see from the scripture, and we're going to look at it a little bit more in just a second, that Paul literally burst on the scene where Jesus took two months before he ever did a miracle. He seemed like he was always very comfortable. And Paul is like, I'm like, and I look at the church in America and it's like, do you know the absolute most important thing that can happen in your life? Everybody, everybody tune in. Most important thing that can happen to your life. I'm gonna say something I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I don't even like saying. I hate saying it. Most important thing that happens in your life is not even coming here and being at church. The most important thing that happens in your life is that you get discipled by Jesus Christ to live the life he's called you to live. Your intimacy with Jesus is more important than anything else because everything ought to come out of that instead of everything happening maybe without that, which is the way I think the church has been shaped. <clears throat> uh, Paul was a zealot. I told you that earlier. That made him a tremendous asset to do what he was supposed to do among the Gentiles, okay? But it made him a pain in the rear end to the Jews. Now look at it with me in the scripture, Acts 9, 28. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and he disputed against the Hellenists, that's Jewish people, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and then sent him off to Tarsus. He is stirring up a hornet's nest. Do you understand that? They sent him away. <coughs> so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was what? Being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Paul has this great zeal, this tremendous knowledge, insight, but the church was better off after they got him out of the way. It says that they had peace and, and, and people were being built up and, and fear of walk, the walking in the fear of the Lord, that, 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 that knowledge, that, that's, that, that's a terminology which really captures what intimacy is, that fear of the walking, that walking in the fear of the Lord. If I get it in the right place, I got fear of the walking dead going there or something, I don't know. But anyway, uh, that, that intimacy that was there and when they got rid of him, all of a sudden it was back. Are you getting this? Now, I love Paul, and I identify with Paul. But I think Paul took off in his knowledge of Jesus more than he did with a time with Jesus. This is a big comparison. Jesus' disciples knew 
him. And from him, they learned everything that, they want, that he wanted them to know. Paul knew the scriptures. He knew all kinds of, of, of what we would call Bible knowledge. And then he meets Jesus. They were in a process. He got it and he ran with it. Because in essence, Paul was a missing ingredient. All his life, he knew what the prophet said. He knew what the words said. He knew the Old Testament. He was trained in it. And then Jesus knocks him off of his horse. And he realizes that Jesus is Lord. And now all of a sudden, everything's clicking. He's exactly what the prophets always said. He's the one. He, and what does he do? Now that he has found the missing ingredient, with that same zeal that he was ready to kill you for Jesus, he now is convinced he's got to tell you, Jesus is it. And I won't fault a guy for that. That's pretty awesome. But do you see the difference? This is not criticism. His knowledge, his zeal, awesome. But he did not run with what the disciples had of just sitting with Jesus and eating and talking and saying, explain that to me. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand about those different kinds of soil what all that meant. <clears throat> Jesus Jesus and Gamaliel were two different kinds of rabbis. Gamaliel was teaching the law. Historians say that he made a statement one time that most of his disciples were getting his knowledge, but they were not getting his application. You know what Jesus was about? It was about the application. This is, this, is, this is what it's like to have a relationship, and this is what you have to share, and this is what you have to teach. This is what I'm telling you, and you need to remember it so you can tell them because that's your job. That's what the Great Commission is, is you telling them what I told you you being able to teach it and explain it and live it the way it's supposed to be. <clears throat> I want you to look at Matthew 11, 28. Because I'm going to say this and then go to that. Paul had Jesus' heart. but he had Gamaliel's head. Jesus showed him that he was the way, but he had trained under Gamaliel and he had that programming inside of him. And though Paul was doing a phenomenal job at taking it out there, Here's what I want you and, and me to remember. We have been invited into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And better than knowing about him or knowing from him, what we ought to know is knowing about him. I want to know who Jesus is more now than ever before. I want to understand the heart of Jesus. I want to understand the whys. I want to understand the motivations of Jesus Christ. And he gives an invitation to everybody. And here's the invitation to you and me. Come to me, all who are, all who labor 
and are heavy laden. Talk about my world. That's it. And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I believe that the reason why the church hurts and the reason why Christianity, true, genuine Christianity as God ordained, the reason why it's not flourishing like it should flourish is because basically we have been taught to give our heart to Jesus. But we have not been encouraged, pushed, taught, motivated to build such an intimacy in the relationship that we have with Jesus that our souls can actually know what it means to have peace and rest. Just look at me. Does peace really describe your life? Do you know what it means to just <laughs> feel like you're in the arms of the Lord like a baby and you got no cares and concerns whatsoever? Does that describe anything about us? No. We are all about the urgency. We are all about get, get it done, get this we have behind us the culture and the pressure of the God of this age who is going faster, go faster, go faster, do more, get more involved, choose this, choose that. And the church has lost its intimacy. As a whole, the people in the church, they are very much about what Jesus is, but they are not living in the relationship that has such an intimacy that they literally have this peace that says, the more I get into your presence, the more everything fits and works. The more I get into your presence, the more the enemy's push loses a voice. We've been invited We've been invited to come to him. And you'll know when you're there because it will be easy. It will be easy. <clears throat> and there will be rest for your souls. I share this with you because I have a, a desire. I have a desire that we would literally become a church that functions out of our love more than our duties. A church that, that is a light into this community more out of our intimacy with the Lord. More out of our intimacy than our knowledge. We've got a ton of knowledge. We know all about him. We just need to know him. Father in heaven, I can't imagine giving my son to die for others. Oh, how great your love for us. What I appreciate on this particular moment is Jesus Showing these 12, even though one will reject them, but showing these individuals right here. This is the ultimate love. And it begins in this intimacy. And then it expands and goes to the whole world. But Lord, let us capture the intimacy. His body was broken for me. His blood was shed 
for me. And that he is calling me to himself. And out of that will come all the ministry that we'll ever need to change the world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.